The intro video was the logo for The Human Perspective, which has purple and orange concentric circles around a photo of Judy Human. This fades into a video with a light purple border with Dennis Billups and Emily Badix in one frame and Judy Human in another. Dennis is a black blind man wearing a gray sweater, black sunglasses, and a black mask around his chin. Emily is a white woman with curly brown hair pulled into a bun wearing a black and red plaid sweater. Judy is a white woman who has short brown hair and is wearing red glasses and a black shirt with colorful flowers and a hummingbird. So welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, we're going to be celebrating the 45th anniversary of the 504 sit-ins with Emily Smith Badix and Dennis Phillips. Now, Dennis was one of the people who were very instrumental in the 504 demonstrations, and he'll tell us more about the role that he played. And Emily came onto the scene many years later. I don't think Emily was born in 1977, were you? I was not. When were you born? <laughs> I was born in 83. All right. So we're going to start getting some background information from both of you. Could each of you please introduce yourselves and explain your connection to the 504 sit-in? Dennis, you want to go first? Uh, my name is Dennis Phillips and uh, San Francisco native, California native, and uh, was introduced to the 504 um, um, demonstration by my sisters, friends, and I think the mayor of San Francisco. Um, and they wanted me to go there and speak and just do, you know, what I could. I had no idea really what I was doing. I had heard some stuff about um, disabilities, uh, people doing a rally. And when I got there, there were people all over the uh, front of the building, they were talking. Kitty Cohn was talking, I think. Um, and then you were talking, uh, Judy. And uh, I just blended in, came in, and then uh, we decided to go in the building, I think around one o'clock in the afternoon or 1.30. It was kind of a cloudy Friday afternoon. Um, I do remember that. And uh, we, we walked in and uh, we just started to uh, be there. And then all of a sudden we just started to uh, sing and talk about disability rights. And then all of a sudden we started, I started to do some chanting because uh, people were just walking around and doing stuff. And I says, well, we better get it, get this thing started and let them know that, you know, we're here. So we started doing some chanting. And my role in the 504 was uh, mostly uh, morale and mostly making sure people uh, uh, were uh, in, enhanced with songs and chants and uh, discussions about uh, themselves. And Dennis, um, I didn't mention you're blind, right? Yes, I am. I'm totally blind. Been blind all my life. And your sister also? Yes, she was. She was blind all her life as well. She passed in uh, 2011. Sorry. It's okay. Um, did she... Was she more active than you were in the disability community at that point? Yes, she was. She was interested. She was activated in the CCB California Council. She was in the ACB, American Council for the Blind. She was at the Lighthouse. She, she was doing things for the blind as well. I was more interested in the general disability population, having been at the Recreation Center for the Handicapped, the Lighthouse, and having been at the Lighthouse's camp, the Enchanted Hills. We both were. So, yeah. Thank you, Emily. So you you were not born in the 70s. Um, what got you interested in disability history in general? And then what drew you to the Paul Longmore Center? Well, I am a San Francisco native like Dennis. And so um, I uh, grew up with a mother who had a disability who was not very involved in disability rights and organizing. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it was a very social justice oriented family upbringing, um, as part of that sort of San Francisco culture. And I was really fortunate to be an undergraduate who was taking this course. It was all about studying bodies and it was about, you know, feminism and critical race studies. And it included like this one day on disability studies. And it was just this like absolute aha moment for me of, you know, just, uh, experiences that I'd really witnessed firsthand and, and, and seen all throughout my life. And 
also some of the ableism that I held and internalized and had to work through and had been part of the problem. And like the two of those together was just like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be part of. And so I was really lucky to be, you know, learning that in the Bay Area where I could kind of immediately start going to events and just got pulled into this amazing community, met Paul Longmore at that point at one of the very first events I ever went to. Um, and then I went on to get a PhD in American studies focused on in disability studies. And I'd come back to the Bay Area and was working at a nonprofit in the final years of my dissertation. And Catherine Kudlick had been, um, uh, knew she was going to be director of the Institute after Paul passed away. Um, and, you know, she kind of said early on, like, I'm going to need somebody who can work really well with me. and We know each other and uh, you have this nonprofit background. And um, so she brought me on. So I've been doing it ever since. And I was not my history. All of my scholarship was really current. Uh, you know, I started the closest thing to history. It was like the 1950s on. Um, so I didn't really think of myself as a historian at all. But when we, Kathy, when she had applied to be the director, she had this idea of wanting to do a disability history exhibit for the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 2015. And so it really started as an ADA history. And the more we dove in, the more it just didn't have the sort of like materialness that you want in an exhibit for the ADA history. But the one story we kept coming back to was 504. And I think like being an SF native, and feeling like nobody knows this story. Why does nobody know this story? Um, we just kept, yeah, we were just hung up on it. And finally, this one day, we just had this meeting where we're like, that's it. We're, we're just, it's just a 504 history exhibit. That's what we're doing, even though it's for the anniversary of the ADA. And so um, as a result, we just got to dive in real deep, got to meet people, like got to meet Dennis through that and all sorts of folks who were part of that history. Dennis. Um you were very prominent in Crip Camp. Um, and I think the point that Emily was just making was there was a richness in the 504 story that many people really didn't know. Your involvement with the impact campaign, how would you describe people's reactions to learning about 504 decades later? Overwhelming, really, it was overwhelming. It wasn't really like, you know, we, you know, made people shout about it, but they became aware of it. And the more they became aware of it, you know, they, they, every time they see you, they say, hey, we know you. It's much more prevalent now than it was, I think, before the movie. And what the movie did is really sent a shot around the world for people to really understand the kinds of mechanics and things that disabled persons go through. And you see that the, uh, the deaf community won an award uh, for their movie and stuff. Yeah. And I think it was because we kicked open the door and uh, opened up uh, a, a lot of people's uh, ideas and minds to what disabilities and, 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 and how disability people live, work, and um, manage their life in the community. Yeah, I like the way you kind of encapsulated many of the things that have happened since um, the 504 demonstrations in 77. You know, Emily, you were speaking about it a little bit before in relationship to 504 overall. People at Sundance and other places would say, how come we didn't know this story? And so I think that's one of the powerful parts both of Crip Camp, and then we'll get into talking more about the Longmore Institute and what it's doing. And I think, you know, um, Dennis, you shouldn't minimize the role that you played in the building. One of the reasons why the demonstrations were sustainable and successful was because of people like yourself who weren't there for themselves, but were there for the the bigger result. Can you tell us a little more about what you did when you were in the building? Well, I'm going to give you a story that happened to me after my wife passed away. And I'm sitting in the house and I get this phone call from Emily. She goes, is this Dennis Phillips? I said, yes, yeah, Dennis Phillips. She goes, oh, we've been trying to reach you. And I'm saying like, what for? <laughs> you know, she goes, 
we want to talk about 504. And I'm saying like, man, that was a long time ago. I don't know if I remember anything. <laughs> so they, they came over to the house, started asking me questions and stuff like that. And a lot of stuff did come back real quickly. And um, then we, we started to do uh, speaking engagements together. And I've spoke at San Francisco State and, and I've spoken uh, Monterey and uh, other places uh, uh, about disability rights and, and the boundaries of disabilities and what the government can and should do to help us in every way possible to have a better life and what we can do for ourselves. So it was really one of those, one of those things that, that really got me back into the flow of things. My nature, um, as far as the 504 thing goes, is that my mother was a community developer. She had um, did some work, uh, the first food program um, in the country um, at the Sunnydale Project. So she was a people person. So I was well-rounded with different people. My, my image was to make sure, since I had a, um, a louder voice than most people, is to move, do chants, sing, and keep the morale high because, you know, well, it's interesting when you know that you could be arrested at any second <laughs> or, or anything else could happen because we were messing with the, the FBI. And um, I noticed after a couple of days, we were trying to figure out, well, you know, what are we going to keep doing? And I'm saying, like, let's just keep it up. And so the, the um, Black Panthers approached me. And uh, they had seen me a couple nights doing stuff with Brad um, Lomax. Lomax, yes. And uh, he says, well, I need to call my boys out here. They need to be here and making sure that they could help and do some stuff in the public disabled. And he did, called them up and uh, they came out. Um, and I've also uh, was a member of the uh, Black Panther since 1977. I think it was April 10th or something like that. And my thing was to make sure that we held this together. And I found out that we were the only ones that were holding this together. Uh, our group, we were very lucky. We had connections. We had the mayor on our side. We had Judy on our side. We had, we had, um, we had a lot of people, Mr. Philip Burton and and uh, a lot of Congress people who were on our side and Evan White who helped us um, uh, made sure that we got noticed by the films and the things that he did uh, when we went on the uh, night night uh, thing to go to Kyle Palmer's house. And I think that's what really broke the country, Judy, is that thing right there that, that Evan White did is showing us doing the candlelight vigil uh, along with other things and, and uh, uh, making sure that uh, we were we were uh, seen by the public, understood by the public. So those things, um, working with the people, working with um, keeping that together, keeping the morale together, uh, keeping our hearts and minds open uh, with different races and all, all different people, um, and keeping us as one group, one people, one mind, one spirit one success unit to keep it going and, and, and make it happen. Uh, that's what my job was to be more of a universal uh, person at that time, because I had been meditating for 15 or 16 years at that time, and I really had an open mind. Yeah, I think as Dennis was discussing, um, he was an important part of keeping people in the building by having a good relationship with many people, meditation and other forms of allowing people to really see the bigger picture, because it was difficult to be in the building. And it was really important for people to believe that they did make a difference. And I think you were really an important part of allowing people to see how each person individually made a difference. Emily, um, Tell us a little bit about your relationship with Paul. I mean, I had the opportunity to know Paul for a good number of years, and I met him, as I recall, the first time when we were at a post-polio conference. Tell us what drew you to him. Well, I didn't know Paul as well as I would have liked. I, I met him through my uh, friend, Stanley Yarnell, who was his doctor, actually, but also worked with him uh, as part of the World Institute on Disability on the board. and. 
Stan would bring me to all these fundraisers and introduce me to Paul every single time. So I met met him at, at some of those things. And then Kathy Kudlick was also, uh, as I was a young student of hers back many years ago, was was would bring me around and introduce me to Paul. And you know, I was really struck by this amazing sense of humor he had. And but you know, I I was still just kind of growing and building my relationship to Paul. And I remember I got back from my honeymoon and hadn't been on email for weeks, and then came home to all these emails of of uh, the loss of Paul when he passed away in 2010. Um, and you know, I, my relationship was has has grown more with him after just because. Uh, after he passed, just because doing the work that I've been doing, it is like following the breadcrumbs that he left behind because his reach is just so incredibly tremendous of just how many students passed through San Francisco State who had a disability and got to have that experience of seeing, you know, a, a, a professor uh, in a position of leadership with a disability and the, the impact that he had. Um, which, you know, I think really relates to what 504 is all about, <laughs> like what part of what has been so great about the exhibit and, and getting to do all the speaking engagements that we've done together, like the Monterey thing you mentioned, you know, Dennis got to keynote at CSU Monterey for a graduation for all of the students with disabilities and, um, you know, so many students with disabilities don't know about 504 history and when they do, it's so amazing to be like, oh, those accommodations, like, I can't decide whether it's just so depressing or so beautiful <laughs> that students just think the government just always gave them those rights, you know, that that was just always a thing. Um, and to get that history, every single time I'll have, you know, when we share one of these things, we'll have a student who's kind of lingering around and you can tell they're waiting to talk to us afterwards. And they'll say like, I have a 504. I've heard that number my entire life. It was mostly my parents talking to my teachers about it. And nobody really explained to me anything about what that means and where it came from. And then, you know, the, they'll say, and I've had students like, you know, literally crying when they're sharing this, that they're like, to know that those rights came because people occupied a building for 26 days, you know, makes me feel so much more empowered to demand it when my teacher's being awful and not giving me those rights as unfortunately is, Still a reality for many students. So you know, I think both 504 and what Paul did in the long run, it's, it's all about that, trying to make sure that next generation of students, uh, you know, feel so much more empowered in their place in a university, their, um, their right to have access. Tell us a little bit more about Patient No More. So it was a uh, ex exhibition that launched in 2015, and we had a we had two components. We had a, a, a major one that was at the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, which is the sort of hub of disability community. Um, and uh, it was a, uh, God, I can't remember the, so a thousand square foot exhibit. Oh, um, <laughs> it was huge. It was, yeah, it had many different pieces. It had multimedia that featured our interviews of folks like Dennis and Judy and uh, we did 40 oral histories to try and capture some of the stories that like hadn't been heard from 504 participants to um, and built those into the exhibit. We tried to make it as accessible as possible in some really creative ways. So one of the things that's followed after is we've done a lot of work with other museums throughout the Bay Area and, and beyond to try and teach about how to make exhibits more accessible. And we learned that through the project. And then there's also a separate traveling exhibit um, that went. So the original exhibit was in the Ed Roberts campus um, for a uh, like about a 10 month run. And then it came to the San Francisco Public Library right across from the place where the 504 protest took place. And it was there for an additional um, several uh, four or five months. Yeah. And then we have a traveling uh, version. And so that was originally just supposed to be on tour for three years from 2015 to 2018. And fortunately people just keep booking it. So it's uh, it's still on set to travel until 2023. It may go even longer than that if people keep booking it. So it's all around the country and that's traveling with a nonprofit called Exhibit Envoy. Um, and so if people look up the longmoreinstitute.sfsu.edu, there's a link for to learn more about the Patient No More project. And we also have a virtual exhibit. So you can kind of dive in deep. You can see some of those um, oral history videos that are put together in certain themes, like what was the daily life like? You know, what were people doing from day to day? Or there's one that's all about the media and talks about Evan White, the journalist, and some of his stories. And uh, one that's about that sort of intersectionality of like what, pro what groups were working together to make this happen. 
Um, so that resource has been uh, really important also as a teaching um, material. So we've been doing a lot of work to try and push that out and encourage teachers to use it in their classrooms to teach this history even further. After people see the exhibition, what are some of the comments they make? Well, the access is big. I mean, in addition to the content, like to have it be so accessible in such creative ways is really exciting. Um, you know, just welcoming folks in and saying like, oh, do you want the braille version or do you want the audio described version? Or do you want the, you know, for blind folks that were like, whoa, what? <laughs> <laughs> like museums are this, you know, world that typically has just been incredibly inaccessible. Um, so, you know, some of the creativity that we were able to bring to that exhibit to really think about access as part of the art form in and of itself uh, and part of the celebration of, of disability and, and not just sort of this like we will be compliant, but like we're going to build this all along thinking about, you know, the many diverse needs of disabled people and how people can interact with this exhibit and really like get into that messy work. So that's one of the biggest things is just how much people learn just from experiencing an accessible exhibit and thinking about how the overwhelming majority of ex exhibitions are not accessible. Um, and then another is just the, um, I think it's the same thing I said, like that people are like, why didn't I know this story? It's just from a time period where the story circulates so much. Yeah. So there's that. And then I think the interdependence piece of 504, like really also is something that gives a lot of folks an aha moment of just hearing about how, you know, how communal it was that, that no meeting started unless there was a sign language interpreter present, that people like work together to make these things happen, you know, to find a way to have a AC unit or, um, uh, you know, to help roll people over in their beds at night so they didn't get bed sores or to read written material throughout the day, like that interdependence thing. I think is something that I know a lot of the students that have um, I've helped tour and see the exhibition have been like, oh, I've never thought about like how valuable interdependence might be or stepping away from independence. What about you, Dan? What do you think? Well, it's not only a human story, Judy. It's not only a human story, but it's a reference story of how this country um, from uh, the ground up democracy, democracy wise is making a difference. What are some of the future steps that um, the Paul Longmer Institute is uh, moving towards? Well, our mission is all about, you know, celebrating and showcasing disability experiences and, and using those at the center with disability expertise to just revolutionize social views. So we do that from a number of things from um, our film festival, Superfest that we run, to you know, public programs and things that really carry on Paul Longmore's legacy through sort of celebrating scholar activists. Um, and then this exhibition was, um, was such a perfect fit for, for you know, the, the core of that mission, just because everywhere we got to share it, everybody who learned this history kind of immediately, you, you understand disability in a new way. And, and yet it's it's done with this captivating story that involves the Black Panthers and San Francisco politicians and just pulls people in. So you can you can teach all those same lessons that we need to be teaching to change people's perceptions about disability without it being pedantic or you know a, a training that people are like, ah, you know. Um, so um, you know, what's next for us? We just continue to find ways to, to do uh, to do more of that, to showcase more of those stories. Um, are we diving into another exhibition anytime soon? <laughs> Probably not, but I tell all the museums that we've worked with where we're doing this, con we do a lot of consulting and we help them sort of think through. And I'm like, after we finished Patient No More, it kind of felt like after you've been married or you, you learned how to organize a wedding and you don't want to get married again, <laughs> but you really want to share that advice that you got. So like, that's basically been you know, when the, when the exhibit was here at the public library, we got to invite some of the museum professionals nearby to, to come and then said, like, let us give you this behind the scenes tour and we'll tell you some of our thinking around access and, and what we did. And I think so many of them think about access just as the sort of compliance model. And they typically have, 
you know, some compliance problems that they're just sort of not doing anything about because they're so worried they're going to get sued mm -hmm. that it's really stopping them from thinking like access can be as much a part of your artistic practice as what's, you know, hanging on the walls or, you know, on the, the, the pieces and sculpture or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, and then, you know, we're always looking for like, what are, what are some of the other stories that we still need to know more about and, and showcase and, um, you know, Paul was taken from us too soon because he did a really incredible job at, you know, ex excavating some of those disability history stories. But um, we're really focused right now on trying to develop more curriculum. In, in California, there's something called the Fair Education Mandate that passed in 2012, mm -hmm. and it made it uh, mandatory to teach disability history in K through 12 curriculum. And we've done a lot of work with teachers trying to find out, you know, what's happening, what are they doing? Yeah, are you helping them? develop a curricula that they could utilize? Yeah, so we've been helping them develop a curriculum. We've also done a lot of trainings to help them think about how do you teach disability history? Because, you know, it's not the same as like LGBT history where it truly is just very, very invisible. And, you know, it was very actively pushed aside. Like disability has been in the textbooks. It is built in. It's just, are they actually like talking about disability in a substantive way when they talk about you know, reconstruction or when they talk about um, the progressive era and some of the sort of social welfare projects that were underway. So um, we've been trying to develop a curriculum. We already have a curriculum packet around 504 and we kind of have used that to kind of build around, but we're, we're looking to develop or we're, we're almost done developing a few other curriculum that could help support that because otherwise it's just going to be FDR and Helen Keller every year. <laughs> and they're important there's, figures, there's, but there's more to disability there's, history. Than there's, that. there's a lot more to that. And yeah, I'm working with a wellness group to help with trauma with people with disabilities and non-disabilities. And I think that's going to have a great breakthrough as far as people understanding the kind of steps and the kind of uh, things that they need to go through to make uh, mechanically make things work. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm working on right now is, is the wellness thing. And it's going to, it should do well. It should do well. And I'm going to try to impact that with um, the Lamar Institute to connect that as well and see what we can do. It is so interesting when we when we did those interviews how many people from 504 talked about we were like how did you get through how did you stay and how many people talked about meditation so I really feel like that was a clear impact that you had on so many people <laughs> it's like just teaching folks like stay present each day at a time you, like, you have to you have to because mm -hmm. it was you know it was as Judy will tell you they they did a lot of stuff to um to, to stop us uh, alarms and things, turning off the showers, doing different, just little things, sneaky stuff. Um, especially when we left to go to DC, I heard there was a lot of stuff that, that they did as well, but just those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of traumas um, that if we can re revisit them in a wellness program now, now we start to lift the consciousness again of people mm -hmm. and break through the, uh, some of the barriers that have been holding still, and they're they're going away, Judy. They are going away, maybe a little bit slower than we'd like, but um, I think we made a hell of a difference, and I'm glad that you're still with me to make a continued difference. One of the areas that I think is very important when you're looking at wellness is also looking at this from the lens of discrimination. And for me, that's very important that we look at discrimination in the area of disability. Because when we look at it only from the remedy perspective, I don't think it really enables us to get to the core of how many people are feeling. The way you talk about yourself, Dennis, and how the 504 activities really got you more involved in the movement you were doing stuff in the area of blindness, but I think 504 was important for you and important for everyone that you touched because it really brought, I mean, maybe I'm saying this incorrectly, so you should tell me if I'm wrong, but I really feel like it really helped you as a black man who was experiencing discrimination your whole life based on race and vision into a position where you were able to really help pull things out of people to allow them to recognize that 
they had rights, uh, that justice was something they should be fighting for. And that's to me, one of the legacies of 504 and ADA and the movement overall. You said it correctly. And I've always, in some of my speeches, talk about Jim Crow and Willie Lynch to make sure we get that out of the law, yeah. get that out of politics and make sure it's known what was done. And uh, uh, with not only with slavery, but with access and some of the laws that still remain there. Um, now that we have a new uh, justice lady in the Supreme Court, I hope that will kick open the door and knock things over and so we could change some of the stuff to become a better, uh, uh, a better people and a better America. But you're right, fighting for justice is still the number one thing. Any final words that either of you wanna put out there about the importance of the 45th anniversary of 504? Well, number one, we're, st we're still here. We're still doing it. And I, I would have not believed it if you asked me years ago, would you still be doing this? And um, how an important engine this has become to this country with all of the things we went through in 2020 and 2021, how we're beginning to kind of lead the, the, the ground cover of justice and how to push it forward. Um, and if, if we can just get to some more voices and, and talk about justice for all, to have a democracy and a community for disabled persons that we could uh, not only learn from it, but learn their genius, learn their gifts, learn what they can do best, understand their thoughts, understand their feelings and their heart. Having that lady go on the Supreme Court, boy, I'm telling you, I am just so, so happy. I really think that's gonna make a difference in the country and on disability. Well, I want to thank Emily, and I deeply want to thank you, Dennis. And I also want to say she will have a tremendous impact if there are more of her on the court. So register to vote, <laughs> learn, read, exercise your vote wisely. Thank you all, and maybe we'll get together for the 50th anniversary. Ooh, sounds fun. Sounds fun. <laughs> Or try to minimize our pain.